Hey, welcome back, everybody, to the We Fix Pain podcast. This is episode number 20 with our very own Dr. Nick Askey. Doc, welcome to the podcast. All right, the topic of this podcast is, you guessed it, Ask Askey, right? Because we uh, pulled our, our, our Rastafarians, our, our ACPs, and uh, came up with five, five, count them five, difficult, tough cases that we want to get, pick your brain about how to get better, how to get these cases better, how to treat, how to manage those conditions. And at the end of the podcast, we have, have uh, about three or four questions on specific management advice. So without further ado, welcome to the We Fix Pain podcast. I am your host, Dr. Dino Pappas. I'm a sports and rehab-based chiropractor with Arasti out of Austin, Texas. On the podcast, we focus on health and wellness-related topics with a specific focus on neuromusculoskeletal care. That's injuries to muscles, tendons, ligaments, joints, fascia, bones, and nerves that lead to pain. We address topics like assessment, diagnosis, treatment, rehab, and management of acute and chronic-related injuries. We humbly ask you and thank you for watching our podcast. Please share if you like this material. We're on Spotify. We are on Anchor. We are on YouTube at We Fix Pain Podcast and my YouTube channel, which is Dr. Dino Pappas. Our guest, Dr. Askey, is a graduate of the University of Wisconsin-Madison, go Badgers, and Palmer D Davenport. Yep. He's been practicing at Arasti since 2010. He's been a course instructor and keynote speaker for educational conferences for chiropractors and physical therapists since 2012. Grew up on a horse farm in Wisconsin and played hockey through college. And he enjoys trail, ultra marathons, traveling with his wife, Mar Marisol. Is that correct? Okay. <laughs> I'm so sorry. It's all good. But it's all Greek to me, man. Yeah. Yep. And playing with his cane, Corso Severus. He's passionate about empowering his patients to get out of pain and then seize the opportunity to remain active or be more active. And that's our very own Dr. Nick Askey. So, Doc. What's your superhero origin story? How'd you end up as a chiropractor? How'd you end up here working for Arasti? Take us through. So I had a lot of sports injuries growing up and my family was kind of a rub some dirt on it. Uh, and I actually had a bilateral spondy grade one Ooh. and L5 uh, on S1 that I sustained sometime in high school. And I remember walking up to my dad going, dad, my back hurts. And he goes, so does mine. And he'd just spin on a dime and walk away. <laughs> so we were that kind of family, but there were some things that you couldn't just rub dirt on. And uh, I actually had a, a bilateral dislocation of my mandible uh, oh, man. in high school because I hip checked a guy and he did a full flip and caught me under the chin with the heel of a skate. Ah. Um, and I had went to a chiropractor the first time for about an eight, 18 month stretch of walking pneumonia that got so bad that nobody could fix it. And my Cairo kind of dug into my history and he changed some things in my diet. Um, Cause being a farm kid in Wisconsin, it's like you drink two gallons of milk a day and you know, that doesn't do you any favors on the, on the mucus front. Um, but he skipped a golf outing on a Saturday and spent two hours working on my jaw so I could eat. Uh, and I'm like, all right, this dude actually cares about his people. Um, and I want to go do that for a living. So I spent like two hours a day in his office as like an independent study for high school credit. Um, and I never really looked back. I was one of the few kids in my high school class that didn't change their mind going through. Uh, but you've known me for a while, Dino, you know that I can be pretty stubborn and headstrong. And uh, so I, I'm not usually a very flippant individual to where I change my mind on stuff once I've made my mind up. Uh, and then my mom was an Arosti patient before I even knew what Arosti was. And she got treated by Shane Arnold. And she's oh, like, wow. all right, these dudes like fix this hip thing I've been dealing with for over a year in a few sessions. You should check them out. Um, and of course, Arosti turned me down because I was still in school. Uh, I was actually the first new grad that Arosti hired. Um, and so didn't have any bad habits, didn't know anything. So that was kind of the, my selling point was the fact that I was a clean slate. 
or just like a, a lump of Play-Doh that they could shape the way they <laughs> wanted to. Uh, and Malleable. I'm glad they took a chance on me. Um, in I would moved to Texas because that's where Rosti was back then. Uh, and spent the first about year and a half of my uh, clinical career on the in the Austin market. Uh, in I didn't Buda. know that. And that then, that. yeah, and so I sp- started in Buda. Uh, and then after 18 months, when Shane Arnold made a transition, he handpicked me to take over his practice because uh, we have similar styles of communication, a uh, little bit different clinical styles, but. Uh, his patients got used to me and they didn't kick me to the curb. And I've been in San Antonio in the third rendition of the ASC or our support center. Mm -hmm. Uh, But that's kind of how we got here today. Um, I'm fortunate to be a fairly long tenured member of our team. Um, And I just, I, I really do like, I do have to think twice and kind of pinch myself when people are like, why don't you go start your own thing? Cause you could easily crush it. And I was like, all right, I don't want all those headaches. Um, in, it was my stance coming out of school. Uh, cause I'd already owned several businesses just in the construction world. Um, on how much of a headache it can be to be a business owner. And I knew that my patients would just get the scraps if I had to be the bookkeeper HR, hire, fire, train staff, be the janitor, fight with insurance companies, um, schedule people. So I knew that if I had to do all that and then worry about everything else, that I wouldn't have time to learn and grow and read and and really develop my clinical skill set at the speed I was able to do it with a Rosti because I was able to delegate everything that wasn't clinical to people that are much better at performing those things than me. Gotcha. Yeah, I, I had the epiphany a couple of years ago, about eight years into being a private business owner, that how life consuming, not time consuming, life consuming it, it was. And, uh, you know, we ended up moving to, to Austin uh, and ended up getting a job with the Rosti. And, you know, the first thing I said to my wife after the first year was, you know, isn't it nice that uh, I, I'm able to, to come home and be home and be present a, a lot more? Uh, because, you know, you can't put a value on some of the other things. Your practice may or may not collect uh, income, but you can't put a value on all the other things that it weighs on you for. Yeah. Yeah. So what, we're curious, what part of Wisconsin did you grow up in? Uh, about an hour north of Madison. So kind of smack dab in the center of the state. Uh, if you were to like look at it in Texas terms, it'd probably be about Waco, <laughs> uh, kind of smack dab in the middle. And then where did you go play college hockey? Uh, U- UW-Madison. Oh, I didn't know that. I was That's just really kind cool. of a, I was not, like, all of our starters ended up playing in the NHL, so I was not near that level, and I only played for two years because Frozen Shoulder actually ended my hockey career. Uh, oh, wow. It was one of the rare traumatic cases of Frozen Shoulder, and they say that pain is the body's request for change, and it just kept me giving me less and less subtle hints. Mm. Uh, that I was going to have to change up something because I was taking like eight Vicodin a day to be able to function and oh, shower man. and not fall and uh, get to class. And it was it was a miracle that I survived undergrad, let alone pulled a decent GPA, being at high as Dr. House for the first two years. But just had to kind of look in the mirror and go, all right, am I going to be a good role model to people if I'm limping down the hall with a cane and a rattling bottle of pills in my pocket? Probably not. And am I going to go to the NHL? Absolutely not. Um, so kind of use my academic uh, scholarship for the second half of undergrad. So it was an easier decision to make because I didn't have to pay for school either way. Yeah. Yeah. And Wisconsin's a great, great, uh, great school academically. And it's a fun, dynamic setting, which I'm sure you enjoyed. Uh, I don't know if you know, I, I worked in the Big Ten as an athletic trainer. So I made the rounds including Madison. That was one of my favorite stops. And uh, my all-time favorite event in Madison was when I got to work the Big Ten Wrestling Tournament mm-hmm. uh, circa 2002, 2003-ish. And uh, yeah, it's uh, fun being working in the Big Ten and then wrestling. And there's always great going to Madison for about a week. Uh, yeah, so, it's a lot like Austin. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, let's talk about some five, five random get-to-know-you questions here. 
so these are just coming in off the top of my head. Um, you ready? Here we go. What yeah. book would you recommend somebody would read twice? Um, I'm going to give you two. The Art of Learning um, by Josh Wadeskin, um, and then Mastery by Robert Greene. Okay. And then why? Mastery is just a great book for any clinician on viewing your field as more of an art form uh, rather than just being a technician hmm. and how perfect can be the enemy of good. And people who get good at doing this usually have a few screws loose and they don't like to be confused. They don't like to um, just throw their hands up in the air and give up. So they kind of have an unhealthy obsession with what they do and how that contributes to mastery of a field. Um, the Art of Learning is a really powerful book. Um, it's an easy read. It's one I reread every year. Um, and it talks about the parallels between mastering and learning a physical skill and a mental skill. Because mm -hmm. Waitskin was the subject that they made on... Uh, the movie Searching for Bobby Fischer after his childhood. He was a chess prodigy. He was beating the Russian masters when he was like eight years old. Oh, wow. Uh, but then it just, he got burned out because it became a job and the pressure got so much because he was so young. Uh, it probably wasn't like biologically mature enough to handle all of that and just kind of like didn't like to do it anymore. And then he became an eight time Tai Chi push hands national champion. Um, after that, and he talks about the parallels of learning chess and learning a, more of a physical endeavor like Tai Chi. Yeah, uh, I, I think the parallel that I most commonly see what, what you're referring to is the youth sports prodigy that exceptional eight, nine, 10, they're playing ahead of their grade. And by 16, 17, 18, they're burned out. Yeah. Forget college sports. They may not be functional for their twenties, thirties and forties. Absolutely. Right? So, yeah. Um, okay. How many times during an ultra marathon do you have to stop to go to the bathroom? Uh, usually about three. You weren't expecting that one. No, but I, I know the answer. Three. U usually about three. Yeah. All right. Cool. Uh, next question. The superpower, uh, superpower that you'd most want to have for you, you personally. MRI vision. Is that right? See through everything. Yep. Make it make my job a lot easier and I'd look a lot smarter than the way I look now. I'd, I'd be the Wolverine man, mutant healing. Father time's catching up with me. Yeah. All right. Uh, describe your personality by a NHL players style of play. Um, I would say that's tough. Um, just because like being a hockey player, it's hard to like, size yourself up to other hockey players personality wise. Um, but I know my style of play was a lot like uh, Marshan for the Bruins. Like I was kind of the, the spicy guy that no one wanted to play against and really got <laughs> under people's skin. Uh, so I'd say that's probably the closest. Nice. Nice. One of my all time favorites. I'm a little biased. I'm a Blackhawks guy. Uh, I am Duncan too. Keith. Duncan yeah. Keith. Yeah, yeah. yeah one of my all-time favorites. Put yep. in lots scrappy. of time, tons of minutes. Yep. Tough dude. Yep. Skill, Long scrappy. Career. Yeah, exactly. Not afraid to get dirty. Not afraid to put it on the net if he had a chance to, you know, uh, hoist one at the net. But yeah, yeah. You'd skate forever, too. That, that yep. would probably be – I'm a marathon guy. Uh, so, yeah, be, be, for me, it would be Duncan Keith. All right. Who would play you in a movie about your life? Uh – I would probably hope it wouldn't be like Bobcat Goldthwait or anything <laughs> like that, but um, I I would I would hope it'd be something like Ed Norton or something. Uh, he's one of my favorite actors. He's uh, talented, but I do have some twists of like Daniel Day Lewis when I get a little pissy about stuff to where it's like, oh, let's leave Bill the Butcher alone. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and he was pretty solid in uh, uh, Last of the Mohicans too. You know his war yeah. face and everything. So I just rewatched There Will Be Blood. Uh, oh yeah. After watching the whole Killers of the Flower Moon, the whole oil tangent, I just kind of like went down that, and I was like, ah, oh, let's 
let's get a little bit more Daniel Day in our lives and and watch this during an oil change in a car maintenance appointment. All right, let's get to the clinical stuff. You mentioned it, uh, frozen shoulder, right? What is frozen shoulder? What is it? What are we dealing with? So it it can look like a lot of things in the early stages, and it's one of those critical things that you need to catch it early to manage it successfully. Um, so it basically there's not a lot of radiographic signs for frozen shoulder in the early stages, other than a little bit of thickening of the coracochromial ligament. Um, and you can see some little dehydrated pouches in the inferior part of the capsule. Um, but I tell my patients that frozen shoulder just makes us look really stupid as doctors because um, it can occur from a endocrine um, imbalance. That's why it's a lot more common in the female population uh, with the, the hormone storm that people go through. It's very common in uh, menopause, perimenopausal women. Um, they actually released a study this year saying that they've seen a 2.5 fold increase in frozen shoulder during COVID. Uh, it was actually oh, wow. added to the long COVID uh, set of symptomatology. Um, <laughs> and it's usually, I didn't see it at all in a vaccinated arm. Um, it's usually in the side they didn't get their, their shot in. Uh, Any suspicion so why? Uh, no clue really, but most people elect to get vaccines in their non-dominant arm. Um, so this was in a lot of females on the right side, right hand dominant. Um, but the, the hallmark signs are active versus passive range of motion in the early stages. Like if you can take someone passively up to in, into internal rotation or end range of flexion and abduction, it's probably not frozen shoulder. But if you feel like you're kind of hitting that hard end feel passively, kind of doing like I kind of do like a, a passive inferior glide of the humerus. And if it feels like it's Tommy boying up and like pulling the shoulder up with it, with that upper trap punching up, um, I'm like, we got to assume that this is the most, the more serious clinical thing and treat it like it's early stage frozen shoulder and not just assume that it's a subacromial bursitis or an impingement like set of symptoms uh, because the cost of missing a frozen shoulder in that first four months is is quite high because then you're just kind of like riding it out in the sidecar with the patient to let time on uh, because you once it locks up there's not a whole lot of magic bullets that will unlock it until it just kind of makes up its own mind to unlock. So uh, to reiterate kind of what you said, you see a, a pretty significant loss in a couple different motions. The first is uh, you, your active and passive motion are roughly about the same. Abduction is kind of what you were describing. Mm -hmm. Do you see a uh, loss of uh, rotation, external internal rotation prior to the abduction? Um. Usually you'll lose the abduction first and then the internal rotation is usually the last thing to unlock and lock. Um, like you get people to where you get them up to where they just are missing that last 10% of abduction and flexion, but they can, they kind of have to do a parlor trick uh, to get their hand behind their back to tuck in a shirt or get a bra on and off. Yeah. You see them kind of roll their body forward and kind of jimmy their arm up. That's also why they get a, a kind of a refractory uh, secondary tennis elbow uh, when they start to lose that rotation because they have to get more motion uh, from the periscapular area in the scapular thoracic joint as well as at the elbow because they're, they're faking internal rotation with uh, end range pronation and wrist flexion to get their arm behind their back. Hmm. Um. Why does this process occur? Why why does the shoulder freeze? Like I said, only like most of them are endocrine driven. Uh, only five percent of them are traumatic. Uh, you see them a lot in post surgical cases because it only takes about four pounds of P to A force to dislocate the shoulder when someone's under anesthesia, especially some of these bigger bariatric procedure patients. 
uh, that they can be quite the load to move from table to table. If you don't have all those high tech hoverboard like buckies that you put people on. Um, but you do see it, like I said, it makes us look like idiots because you can see it after uh, an infection or a virus or a flu shot, or there's a lot of different things that can cause it. Um, in that same study, I read about COVID having an uptick um, corresponding to the two and a half times increase in frozen shoulder. Um, they found that patients that have been diagnosed with clinical depression are eight times more likely to get frozen shoulder and have a poor outcome on their resolution. So like anything, there, there, there is a biopsychosocial component to all the things we manage. Um, there are some genetic markers that predispose people uh, to get frozen shoulder. And Which those ones? are usually, I, I, it was a bunch of letters and numbers that I never memorized, but it's the same gene that kind of predisposes people to Dipitrin's contracture uh, and plantar fibromas. Um, so they just have a genetic pr propensity for their, their fascia to get a little gnarly and Keloids not too. Are they more likely to like in that subclassification for scarring like a keloid as well? I'm not sure if it's on the same, um, in that same ballpark because I, I look back and I can't, imagine, I can't remember seeing frozen shoulder in a ton of African-American patients, which are usually more of your keloid formers. Um, so I doubt that it's in that same neighborhood, but it'd be interesting to see. Nick, sometimes when uh, I've seen frozen shoulder, I've seen a case series out in the literature and anecdotally over the course of the year uh, years, I've kind of had a couple things that have been diagnosed as frozen shoulder and you kind of dig around and you, you look through the history and the exam and you say, I'm not buying this one. Um, can you speak to other differentials that would have the uh, presentation? Yeah, it's frozen shoulder. When you start to get into the nitty gritty, your exam, your history, you're not buying it. Uh, a common one that kind of gets labeled as frozen shoulder because of its non-traumatic nature and its propensity for the demographic uh, that it goes after is like calcific tendinopathy of the shoulder, because um, it kind of goes after the same population with females with thyroid disorder in their 40s and 50s and 60s. Um, that's the most common one that all kind of bite on and go, okay, this is not developing like a frozen shoulder. And then we do an, an image and see, oh, like you have calcific tendinopathy in your shoulder. That's why this is kind of sucked and it hasn't resolved or progressed at the, the same speed as we would expect from a frozen shoulder, which is like just our, our goal when we get someone early on is to keep it from locking up if we can. And there's kind of mixed literature of getting a steroid shot or a PRP shot in the shoulder early on in the first three to four months. I uh, don't find that that's productive if you pull the trigger on it when someone's had it for six or eight months. Uh, and, and the doctor's probably going to bend a bunch of needles trying to get it in there anyways. Okay. I, uh, I there was a case series years ago that mentioned uh, looking at the spinal accessory nerve where it exits here, like a, an entrapment of the spinal accessory will produce an abduction, that hiking of the shoulder. And then you start to run out of real estate uh, in the glenohumeral joint where it starts to bang up against things. And there was another uh, differential piece that I read that it's possible in some you may have suprascapular nerve uh, entrapment somewhere in the posterior and I often find they're very sensitive. Um, those are actually kind of amenable to the things that we do. So sometimes I go sniffing around and, you know, I'll either start working on the SEM and scalenes or I'll start mobilizing the, the suprascapular nerve, you know, kind of getting them into this position like a pin and strip. And it doesn't often do it, but every now and then I get one of those cases that will respond when they were told they had frozen shoulder. So I was yeah. wondering if you had any, any tidbits like that. Yeah, like another hallmark factor that I've found, and this is just anecdotally, uh, I haven't seen it in any literature, is if you are on the fence on whether something's frozen shoulder, like early stages and kind of that early freezing phase, um, 
and you're kind of coin flipping on whether it's an impingement or a bursitis is if supraspinatus is five out of five, no pain, posterior cuff, five out of five, no pain, but their subscap is slightly weakened and painful. Uh, that's another thing that I've found is a very um, handy clue to use for that. Um, just knowing that it's frozen shoulder and then I have the talk with somebody to set the realistic expectations that this is just really going to suck. Like it's, I'm not going to treat them three days apart. Cause I'm like, would you go get your hair cut every three days? They're like, no, I'm like, well, it's kind of like that. And I'm just here to get you through plateaus and progress. Uh, and kind of put the accessory fires around the neck and periscapular area and the lateral elbow out before they become projects for me to work on along with the shoulder itself. Nick, when do we initiate a trial of care with these patients versus when do we say, hold, we just need to wait this out? When do we say with these folks, hey, let's send you to the orthopedist? Uh, if it's in that first three, four months, I send them to the orthopedist day one um, because A, I want a second set of eyes on their case in case I'm off base. Uh, but I usually catch them before the ortho will. I've had some disagreements with some of the shoulder specialists in town on whether it's frozen shoulder or not. Uh, and I don't fight with them. I just let time prove me right because I'm usually spot on with my instincts. But I usually co-manage these fairly early because if it does lock up on your watch, who gets blamed for it? Um, if you lose track of them and they end up in an ortho office on their own accord, then that ortho is going to be like, they should have sent you over here earlier. Like this wouldn't have locked up if I got an injection in there early. Um, but in the ones that are not appropriate to send to an orthopedist because it's been too chronic, I tell them like, once we've showed some competence in your exercises, you can get a little bit of sanity and relief. Uh, and you've showed competency on being your own doctor for this. Then I'm going to cut you loose and you come in when you need to. Um, because if I can't predict when you're going to need me, I'm not going to like try to guess and just schedule something for the hell of it. Like I tell people, if I'm your GPS uh, and we're going to El Paso, it's my job to get you onto I-10 because I know you're not going to get lost very easily. And it, we may be seven hours from El Paso when I let you go on your own uh, to where a lot of these frozen shoulder cases are like that. Or we may only be a couple exits away from El Paso because the patient's 95% better. But I tell people, like, if, if you're 100% on your last visit, I kept you one too many visits. Can you, once you initiate an early trial of care, month one, month two, month three, can you uh, keep somebody from the downward spiral or are you more so trying to manage the fact that they won't bottom out? Like, what's your thought about? initiate a trial of care, they do feel a little bit better. Are you telling people like we can keep this from going south from, you know, freezing to frozen and you don't even need to go into thawing? Or are you just saying it's going to be a softer landing? It'll still be a thud, but a softer landing. How do you, how do you explain that? I just tell them, I'm like, this is a, a nonlinear process and you're going to gain range of motion back way faster than you lost it. Um, it's going to be once the thawing phase initiates, like I got all my range of motion that I lost in three years back in one day. Um, and there was no rhyme or reason behind it. Um, so I tell them like, these don't last forever, but we just have to keep banging the rock and doing the things that are helping. And because there's really nothing else out there, like you're not going to send them for a, a an MUA where they have to do daily therapy afterwards anyways. Yeah, that's uh, the uncommon, unspoken about thing about MUA. Most people assume they just walk in, they put out, they stretch them under anesthesia, they do a little manipulation, good to go. And the answer is no. Typically, the protocol is you manipulate them consecutively like three or four days a week, and then you send them for physical therapy for six weeks after. That's the fallacy. Yeah, and when people know that there's no easy way out, it's like, all right, like we're stuck with the, the slow, boring diet and exercise version of fixing this. 
Because I'm like, if there was a magic bullet that I could send you somewhere and they would have the magic way of fixing this, uh, like you'd already be on your way out the door. But if I know what's going to happen when I send you out into the tump and it's going to be a very frustrating and expensive uh, process, I'm going to protect you from that. But most people, when you lay that out in an informed consent conversation and go, I'm, it's my job to tell you what you need to hear, not what you want to hear. Um, people generally are, are bought in and they accept the fact that you have their best interest in mind and you're trying to protect them from either a, a really arduous process that's going to cost them a lot of time and money and not yield a better outcome. Um, and you're trying to protect them from people that may take advantage of them because with conditions that don't really have an easy fix, you see a lot of snake oil salespeople that come out of the woodwork, like with diabetic neuropathy and all these other things, like there's really no easy way to fix it or resolve it. So you have all these guys with their foot baths and lasers and homeopathic remedies, like, um, trying to Aaron Rodgers, these people. <laughs> and it is not a productive thing. And if your patient doesn't have a healthy amount of skepticism or doesn't ask questions, they could get taken for a ride. And I don't want to aid and abet that uh, to happen. Last, uh, last little bit on the subject. You mentioned, and I think what's a really undervalued piece of this, the metabolic healing component, thyroid, blood sugar regulation, blood pressure regulation, um, autoimmune disease. These are absolutely critical. And I think in MSK medicine, underappreciated and undervalued. To what end do you discuss it in office? What advice do you give? Do, do you refer out to like functional integrated medicine or, or back to, to primary care? How do you discuss, manage the, the endocrine metabolic piece, which I think for a lot of people is something that we're not very comfortable with in, in MSK medicine? So I tell people, yeah, this situation sucks, but you've also ignored a lot of check engine lights to get you here uh, to where if this is the one check engine light that you can't put electrical tape over, uh, it could be a life changing moment for the patient in a good way to uh, change their diet up, get more regular blood work with their doctor, actually get a freaking primary care doctor so they can have someone to manage their complex health issues. So that's something that I sit down with people and go, hey, I'm not your endocrinologist. I am not your primary care physician. I am not your internist, but you do need those things. And if you don't have them, I can link you up with people that I do trust in those fields uh, to get the proper care that you need. And we can use this as the kind of... Um, the blessing in disguise that it got you to actually change your life up. Uh, Cause I had a lady with a shark hot foot and like, I knew that the x-ray was going to look like popcorn before I even did it. Um, and I was like, what's your A1C? And she's like, I don't know. And her wife looked it up and it was 14.6. Ouch. ouch and I'm like, ouch. you do realize that the five year survival rate of somebody who has an A1C that elevated uh, you got about an 80% chance of dying inside of five years. So this, we can view this ankle as a hindrance, or we can view it as your life-saving angel uh, that got you to change your life up because this lady was in her late 30s and she actually changed her diet up because she's like, oh, I'll just get surgery. I'm like, no surgeon's going to even let you in the front door with an A1C of 14.6 no. because you're going to get a gangrenous ulcer on your foot and you're going to lose it. Yep. Yep. Uh, that's a good way of framing it. Sometimes there's an opportunity, an opportunity cost. And the opportunity for her is your foot's just a cue that your lifestyle is a big problem. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, uh, with regards to the foot, you know, musculoskeletal pain can come and go. But if you have this big elephant, uh, you know, the white elephant in the room or the big hairy elephant in the room or whatever, yeah, that's, that's an important part of your, your being on this planet, survival, basically. Yep. Um, let, let's flip this a little bit. The second most common question that we got from our Rosti colleagues was the topic of tendinitis and tendinopathy. So tendinitis, tendinosis, what's the difference and how do we treat the osis? How do we treat the itis? So the itis is the acute stage of a tendinopathy where it's more of an inflammatory process. 
uh, where you kind of have to play firefighter to get the inflammation down uh, before you play arson investigator, because a lot of people will alter their movement patterns based on a response to pain. So you kind of, you can get your, you can kind of get lost and make some faulty assumptions and logical fallacies if you're treating your exam as a 100% valid from a functional testing standpoint when someone's in a bunch of screaming acute pain um, because they're going to alter their movement strategies and their variability of movement in a response to protect the area. Um, and then the tendinosis is more of the chronic presentation, which is more of a um, lack of resources type of a situation to where you have less nutrients for repair, less blood supply, a more necrotic environment to where it's not, uh, or a more ischemic environment uh, where you have less uh, vascular supply to an area. And it's just more of like a, um, a, a condition that you have to load the tendon in a somewhat a uh, safe pain level of four or less to get adequate blood flow to that tendon. And what people don't realize is you're not, you're not going to see a lot of structural changes in the tendon when it hurts versus not hurting. Uh, and the concept in tendinopathy management is treat the donut, not the hole. Um, because you're probably not going to fix the lesion in the tendon. Uh, but you can increase the cross-sectional area of the tendon so that lesion that is the same size is less of a percentage of the hole with the tendon being a more robust, larger tendon with better blood supply. Our goal is not to be the, the Chip and Joanna Gaines of people's tendons uh, and make them look very different. We just want them to handle activities of daily living and loading and be more robust and strong. And that is a process like you're not going to get strong in three visits. Um, your strength gains in three visits are more from pain reduction and threat reduction. And, um, and you're just going to have a, a better handle on what's going on. People don't think they have elbow cancer or heel cancer. And they're like, okay, I'm safe. I'm being helped out through this process. And it's kind of like, when you start strength training, you get those big novice gains, and those are more from neurologically driven gains than they are from muscle hypertrophy gains, unless you're taking the, the spicy creatine uh, that is going to help you get gains faster. Uh, but that's not a natural way of the body laying down tissue. And so I tell people like the same thing with the GPS analogy. It's like this, all the studies on loading Achilles tendons are done over 16 to 24 weeks. I'm not going to keep you around here for 16 or 24 weeks. But if we know that you're on the path and you're not going to need a lot of external guidance to keep you on the path, then we're going to cut you loose and let you finish it up on your own. And most people are, are amenable to that. They're like, okay, that sounds good. I don't expect you to take me to my house and tuck me in. Like they just want an Uber drive to the front door. Especially with the holiday parties, mountain man, get, get the Uber right now. Right. Yeah. Get a little too much spicy eggnog and we got a problem. Yep. So uh, I'm going to reiterate some really important points um, uh, for, for our audience and for our listeners. He talked about blood flow, blood flow and blood flow is key and critical because of all the, the soft tissue structures in the body, muscles, tendons, ligaments, uh, joints, cartilage some of the worst blood flow to a soft tissue is the distal portion of the tendon right so uh there's no way to expedite or speed this up and the answer to the question is the more you mobilize it the more blood flow you have but you're still feel, uh pushing a piano up a hill you can get to the top it's just a slow process step by step by step so um if we have to predict tendinopathies, and you talked about the literature from the start to the end of it, assuming we're starting a loading program today, it is 12, 16, 2023. When can I feel the initial benefits of a loading program? When am I in the middle phases? And when will I say, hey, I'm 90, 95%, go back to the gym and crush it. Give me the time frame. So it depends on what that person's demands on their body are. If they're a professional athlete and they have to jump out of the gym and they have a, a cranky Achilles, 
that's going to take longer than if someone just wants to walk with their, their friends in the park, because with those, you don't have to really belabor the fourth phase of rehab for a tendon, which is more plyometric and ballistic loading because they don't need that a lot in their, their normal daily lives. But a pro athlete may be in that phase four of their plyometric loading for uh, four to six weeks until they get that last little bit out of there. Um, so in general, I tell people like, yeah, you're going to feel good enough to live your life in three to four weeks, uh, for most of these things, but it's not going to be what we would stamp as resolved for like that amount of months, not weeks. So I just give yeah. people guidelines of like, if the pain is dull, achy, fatigue, or throbbing in less than a four and you recover inside of 24 hours. That is a good thing because you just got stronger. You got some loading in, you got some exercise in. That was great for you physically, physiologically, and mentally to build confidence in that injured area. But if the pain is sharp, shooting, stabbing, nervy, and higher than a four, and it, or it flares you up for multiple days, that doesn't mean that we develop a fear avoidance behavior of that activity. We just mean that at that snapshot in time, you are not ready to do that activity yet and it was outside of your functional envelope of what you were able to tolerate because what um, people get into is they they hopscotch the sweet spot like they do nothing because they're scared and then they blow it out of the water with the level of activity that injured it in the first place and then they get really discouraged and pissy and then they rest it again and and then they go do the same amount of loading so their brain starts to view all activity as poison and not medicine. But the difference between medicine and poison is in the dosage. So you just need to teach people how to think like that. And then you know they are not going to like wander off course when they are not under your care plan for the last visit to what we would stamp as resolved finish line. There's these in our, in our office where I'll, I'll treat them three or four sessions hopefully just to put some of the acute symptoms down. And what I'll say to you is I'll follow up with you in the office at about 30 to 45 day intervals. And all I'm doing is bringing them back, reassessing them, seeing if they can tolerate more load and force and updating their home program. And I will tell them, depending on the length of how, the, how long this tendinopathy has been there, this will be anywhere between four months of a loading program up to about 16 months. And I'll set the expectation. The more chronic it is, the longer it's going to take to get to get better. The more acute that we have it, we can shut it down and modulate that. And you can see some initial benefits within approximately three to four months. And that's what I'll, I'll tell from the time frame. I think you bring up an important point too, when you start talking about exercise and tendon-based exercise, we are all products of when we are uh, done with our training, never give a patient an exercise that will make them uh, worse. And then you will define worse as producing pain. It's completely different in a tendinopathy, right? So, so go ahead. Go sir. ahead. So I use you need some discomfort in the tendon because I tell him Arnold didn't win titles with pink dumbbells. Like his training hurt, but he also wouldn't have won titles if it hurt too much and he was injured and he ripped his tendons off the bone. So we need some productive level of discomfort because you don't make diamonds without pressure. Like you need to load the tendons. That's why Kawhi Leonard didn't stay a spur because everyone was tearing their patellar tendon that year uh, and their quads were slinking up their femur. Um, so he had such a fear avoidance for loading. So as soon as he hit a one out of 10, shut it down. And he didn't hit that minimal effective dose threshold level to revascularize in hypertrophy that area. And, and I use a funny little analogy. Hopefully this helps our listeners here. I'm a, uh, you know, I, I'm kind of learned from the Annie O'Connor school. If you make it fun, you make it a song, you make it, you make them remember it. They'll often remember it. I'll use the words uh, two, three, four, no more, right? Like strengthen it. If you're at a two, three, four, you're doing good. If we're at five, we're like the BJ's man. We're staying alive, right? Staying alive, staying alive, right? So if it's five and it's trending up, 
uh, I recommend, all right, we need to cut it back, sets, dose, reps, hold times. If we're five and it's going down to four, three, two, one, you're doing, you're doing right. Your body's making that adaptation. If we're seven, eight, uh, seven, eight, uh, six, seven, eight, I hate. So six, seven, eight, I hate. I'm not strengthening it. If your pain is six, seven, eight out of 10, 10. And if you're strengthening it and you're nine to 10, never again. And that's kind of my moniker and that's kind of my slogan that I utilize for this uh, concept of tendinopathies. Two, three, four, no more. Five, staying alive. Six, seven, eight, I hate. Nine and 10, never. Yeah, so um, what, what I end up doing is I end up talking to patients about pain and loading tendinopathies with pain. And I use a kind of funny little analogy. And the analogy looks something like this. It's like two, three, four out of 10, no more. And if I'm five, I'm like the Bee Gees man, I'm staying alive, right? And what does that mean? If I'm five and I'm trending up, got to bring it back down. If I'm five and I'm going down to four, three, two, one, thumbs up. And if I've, if I've had six out of 10, six, seven, eight, I hate. And nine and 10, never again, never doing that one again. And it's a quick little easy way to, to kind of get in my patient's ears. It's okay to train with pain. In fact, we want it four or below, like you said, if I'm five, I'm kind of monitoring five becomes four thumbs up five becoming six. We need to back it back down. Yeah, um, that's great. You mentioned four phases of, of tendon rehab. Um, you mentioned the last phase, the dynamic, the ballistic will reload it in a fast, rapid cycle really quickly and abruptly like your plyometrics. What are phases though? One, two, and three of your, your algorithm for rehabbing a tendon. So these are concepts that can be debated based on whether it's a lower limb or upper limb tendinopathy, because you have all these schools of thought of these experts of um, the, the preference for heavy, slow loading versus um, eccentric or concentric or isometric. But the kind of the basic protocol that I look at for people is we use isometrics more for the research-driven knowledge of that we know they have an analgesic effect. So that gives the patient kind of a 45-minute ibuprofen doing a 30 to 45-second isometric contraction of that particular area. So it gives the patient and empowers them and kind of reduces the threat. Um, and then you can progress them into eccentric loading programs as the threat to movement is lowered with the isometric loading. And then you can get them into a more concentric driven rehab protocol. And then you fork off into the ballistic, plyometric, and sport specific loading uh, so that you can get the person ready for their sport or their hobby or their activity. Um, so let's take an Achilles tendinopathy for instance, like I would have them just do like, I like isometric step holds, or we have them just kind of hover their heel up with a dumbbell on their knee to hit that soleus component. Um, and then we'll progress them into some eccentric, um, heel drops, uh, and the setup on that would be different based on whether it's a mid belly. Uh, tendinopathy, or it is a insertional tendinopathy on where you stop at neutral, or you can go into a negative angle. Uh, and then you would just give them the, the concentric and eccentric piece in that third phase. And then you develop some more like um, lower load hopping strategies for that final phase. Um, and some people aren't ready to jump rope yet, but you can easily get someone in a glute bridge and they elevate their heels and then they just kind of pogo on their foot when they're laying on their back. Um, and then that integrates that ankle hip axis and gets them talking together because there's probably a bunch of uh, breaks in the signal that preceded the injury uh, and loaded the gun, so to speak. So you're kind of covering all your bases on that progression. Yeah, I agree. Oftentimes in these tendinopathies, we focus solely on the on the area of pain, but at some point in time, we need to assess the kinetic chain for why, why the tendon misbehaved uh, in the first place. Doc, how do we get buy-in for a progressive loading? Because uh, this is a lot of patient, I need you. I need you more than you need me. 
So how do we get the buy-in? How do we get the patient to be a, a willing participant in a long program of uh, rehab that is painful, that uh, the time frame of which is uh, not quite cl crystal clear when they'll get that magic word resolution? How do we get the buy-in? I get it basically because I know what their alternatives are on uh, and their efficacy and they don't like they think that oh like I'm comparing this to doing nothing and this doing all this work that may be painful or uncomfortable and there's a delayed gratification of 4 months uh it becomes a really gnarly Stanford marshmallow experiment on uh, of delaying gratification to get another marshmallow but if you tell them like all right like these are your options for this. Like I could send you for a steroid injection. That's going to be really awesome in the short term, but you have a higher instance rate of rupture, whether it's around the elbow or the Achilles. Um, and in three months, that's going to wear off and you're going to be right back in here listening to me anyways. And same thing with oral medications. Um, if there is another avenue that's evidence-based, I'm going to let them know that that is available to them. But I'm like, you didn't lay on a table like with meat, like you're a piece of meat with eyes and create this problem. You're not going to lay on a table and get someone to passively fix it for you. So if they know that the, the grass is not greener on the other side of the fence and there's a bunch of like landmine dog turds in the, in the yard on the other side of the fence, they're more <laughs> likely to hang out with you in your yard. And you're yeah. not being deceitful. You're just making them aware that there's a reason you're taking them on as a patient, even though it's going to be a frustrating process for everybody involved, because you're sherpaing them through your process. And if you believe that your process is the most value-based for the patient and will give them the most permanent solution for their problem, or at least the highest chance for it, then you need to explain it like that. Because if you know the person's in the right place, but they don't know, or they're kind of in the middle of their doctor shopping, it's going to be a very contentious relationship that's going to be frustrating for all involved. Yeah, I usually try to, at the end of the first consultation, if I sniff chronic tendinopathy, I'll lay all the options out on the table, the pros and cons. And like you explained, we have the least invasive, but the most active. You have to be a willing participant. And the outcomes long-term are significantly better with a progressive strength training program. But it's labor intensive. You got to do the work, but the the significant negatives of the the cortisone injections, the surgical management, and all that are to the point where you know um, I don't want to say you have to be a fool, but you really have to think twice about about those because the outcomes are long term not any better. So, like you said, delayed gratification. Can you wait for this to be effective? Your outcome will be better long term, and if you can't, you want to go water skiing in Tahiti or you know, you're hiking the Dolomites in Italy or whatever, maybe you take the short-term thing, but over time, no, it ain't going to do it. So we have to temper their expectations because you feel great walking off the table after a cortisone injection for tendinopathy, but you have to pay the tax collector at some point in time. And I, I do tell people, I'm like, some of this is motivated by pro sports. Um, like Adrian Peterson is the bane of the existence of every knee orthopedist on the planet <laughs> because of how yeah. fast he came back from his ACL repair. But it's like, all right, you're a 60 year old lady with a BMI of 37. Like you're not going <laughs> to come back at the same speed as that freak who did nothing but rehab for six months. And then a lot of these decisions for patients are driven by the standard of care written up by the third party payers and a bunch of hospital administrators in the athlete timeline. Like when Tua got the tightrope procedure on his ankle to play in the national championship, that was driven by million dollar donors and boosters, not a third party payer or determining the necessity on when to pull that trigger. I'm like, J.J. Watt didn't have to get all those surgeries, but he did it based on the timeline of a team and a general manager making those decisions. They're business decisions. And business decisions are not always in lockstep with what we know is evidence-based or standard of care. 
Yeah, and um, Aaron Rodgers has been the bane of my existence as a Bears fan, and he may turn out to be the bane of the uh, existence for Achilles tendon repair procedures. So, yeah, those internal yeah. braces are going to change a lot of surgical interventions, but that internal brace is very strong. But if he comes back too quick, he is going to get like a sloppy elongation of his Achilles tendon, and it's not going to be able to store as much potential energy. And it's almost going to be like cracking the whip to where there's too much slack between the train cars. And it, it's probably not going to rupture again, but it could very much limit his production in future years and long term if he rushes back to a team who has no prayer of making the playoffs. Yeah. All right, let's flip base here. We talked about tendonitis. We talked about frozen shoulder. The third bane of the existence of our ACPs, plantar fasciitis and plantar fasciopathy. What is the plantar fascia? What does it do? Plantar fascia, I explain, is the leaf spring of the body. Uh, it helps you buffer force and ground reaction force from the ground. Um, in plantar heel pain, I tell people, like, um, we start locally, but we have to zoom out globally to kind of catch some other things that could be causing it uh, all the way up to the hip and the low back um, because – if you don't have adequate hip extension, you're going to have a more bouncy, prancy pony gait because you're getting more of that terminal stance um, kind of forward progression uh, from the gastrosoleus complex and not from the glute uh, just due to the protective nature of the body. If you have too much anterior hip tension and you can't get extension of a, a pelvis on a fixed femur um, with just due to restriction in the anterior hip, you're gonna have more of a calf dominant strategy that's going to pick the scab on the heel um, and irritate things. Uh, some people will just get like fat pad atrophy as they get older. That's kind of the, the, the crash pad for the heel. Um, and what people don't realize is the, the calcaneus is more like uh, one of those, it's more like one of those big blob things you see at summer camps where big fat dad will jump and launch a kid into the water. Um, like the people think that the calcaneus has the bone, like the density of a rock, but it's pretty deformable because the cortex is not very thick. Um, and that's why if you pinch the sides of the heel and it hurts underneath, it's like, yeah, you got a stress fracture of your, your calcaneus. Those are, those are missed a lot. And that squeeze test is not very difficult to do. But I tell people we test um, more like big toe extension, uh, ankle dorsiflexion, hip extension, internal rotation of the hip uh, before we go elsewhere, just to kind of make sure that we have the necessary um, kind of implements in the Swiss Army knife so that you're not left out in the woods without the one you need. Yeah, I, I agree, especially when it comes to the fat pad and then the calcaneal stress fractures. Now, my diagnostic cluster is, you know, uh, if I get plantar fasciitis tensile, it can't handle tension. Uh, that's when you get the windlass test or you have them toe walk and it hurts. Uh, you, in my opinion, is you treat those like a tendinopathy, progressive strengthening is the name of the game. But you, uh, if you start to hear on the plantar fasciitis, it hurts them and it's worse first thing getting out of bed or moving around. Uh, after sitting for a period of time, ischemic, you mobilize the heck out of that sucker, you bring in blood flow. But when you start to get impact, 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 what's impact? It bothers me more on heel strike. Walk on your heels. Nope, don't want to do it. You squeeze the calcaneus and you pound on it. You can start to get impact mechanism. That cortex of the bone down there is susceptible in the fat pad underneath. Then it becomes, like you said, protecting the bone, whether it's cushion or whether it's confirming with an MRI. So yeah, there's some things that live down there that are not not very nice, not very, um, not very good for patients. Yeah. Um, we talk about uh, the, the uh, opposites, the differentials uh, here of uh, stress reaction, fat pad atrophy. Um, what else lives uh, in the plantar heel? Uh, you could have like a tarsal tunnel syndrome, uh, Baxter's nerve entrapment. Um, you could have just a, uh, an S1 radic. Um, and those are, um, 
like I don't see it like an S1 radiculopathy that that's the only uh, pain site. I have seen it in the past, but my more common differentials are like uh, posterior tibial tendinopathy as it scoops around the medial side. Um, you can get like a flexor halicus longus tendinopathy. Um, there, there are some other things that live in the heel, um, but sometimes the, the testing is not perfect. So it's kind of like a knee meniscus or shoulder labrum. It's like if they have a million tests for something, chances are those tests are not very valuable in isolation and they suck. And it's just kind of a strength in numbers game. Um, but if people don't get better on the timeline we expect, uh, then it's like, all right, let's start doing some like neurodiagnostic testing or advanced imaging. Uh, but a lot of times I'll, my initial test, if I feel like I'm kind of getting off course would be, all right, let's confirm that we have a chronic thickening of the plantar fascia with an ultrasound uh, and kind of visualize the nerves and see if there's some uh, swelling around the nerves there so we can get a little bit more direction before we just start throwing money around on a lot of these advanced diagnostic testing. There's a litany of treatments, and if you go on YouTube or Google or, you know, your local running group who, guru, uh, people will throw anything and everything at plantar fasciitis and plantar fasciopathy. So I'm going to list a bunch of treatments and therapies, and I want you to match. Uh, I want you to match who responds to this type of treatment, what, what criteria do we know that they will respond to specific types of treatments as well, because there's a, a whole kit on real quick, if we can get like one or two sentences. So who is the patient that will respond to manual therapy, the things that we do, you know, the, the myofascial release, tissue manipulation, the active releases, the Grastons of the world, which, who is the patient, plantar fasciitis, that will respond to manual therapy? Usually the people that respond the best are goal oriented, like athletes, uh, not necessarily a super high BMI with bilateral heel pain. Um, and people that, you know, it's like, all right, the, we got our positive, like toe walk, windless, that kind of thing. They, they tend to respond fairly well. Um, versus if the heel pad is bruised or atrophied, it's like, all right, we're going to show you how to tape this stuff up and kind of put some protective cushioning or your little house crocs uh, just to keep from banging that thing into the concrete floor. Okay. Who, who is the patient that will respond to? We don't need to do manual therapy. We just need to rehab them. Um, more of the the patient base that may be bilateral or they have a BMI thing that's contributing to the problem in more of the, um, the other cases that we talked about to where it's like, all right, these are more of the, um, tensile loading things to where it's like, all right, we just need to stretch this thing out. It doesn't necessarily need a, a super long loading period. They just have they just need to be beat up like a baseball glove once or twice, and then they just reinforce that at home. Dry needling. I've had some patients inquire and ask me about dry needling for plantar fasciitis. Who do we want to send to dry needling, or who should we give information? You know, dry may needling may be for you. Uh, dry needling, if you do have some carryover into the deep posterior compartment of the leg, uh, or you just need someone who's got like, if you see their fourth and fifth toes are kind of like curling underneath, um, that's a sign of quadratus plantae weakness. Uh, and that does respond fairly well to dry needling to kind of wake it up. Mm. Uh, it's almost like a, a painful muscle energy technique, uh, mm. to get that quadratus plantae firing. And you'll see like the fourth and fifth toes are like kind of trying to get pinned under the third one. Uh, because of the mechanics of that uh, that pivot point between the bones that are attached to the the cuboid and the ones that have their own cuneiforms. So, is this a neurological inhibition, or is this like um, like a flexor tendon contraction, where over time the tendon starts to to go into go degenerative changes, and you start to get you know like a flexor tendon, but the quadratus plantae is it more so the tendon? Is it more so the neurology? 
on, I believe it's more so the tendon and the balance between short and long flexors and, uh, and extensors to where it's kind of the same process that makes the second toe kind of hammer up uh, because these people have an imbalance between their, their short extensors and their long flexors. I get some questions about modalities. The other modalities that are common that we start to see some stuff on the internet for are shockwave and laser therapy for plantar fasciitis. Who would be the person that would most benefit from either shockwave or laser therapy? Shockwave, I'm a big fan of it. And we've had uh, a lot of patients respond positively to these non-responsive, uh, stubborn cases of chronic heel pain. Um, in the laser, um, in my opinion, laser is for people that want to waste money. Um, like it does work for certain things, but I haven't seen a lot of concrete positive things that happen outside of the kind of the placebo effect of I paid a lot of money to do this, so I want it to work. Does the quality of the laser or the depth of penetration or the amount of, um, uh, photons matter or is it more so the modality itself by design and by nature is just not very efficacious? Yeah, the the productive wavelengths of laser, um, you have your class three and your class four lasers um, and those class four lasers are not going to be really accessible to a patient on a home basis because they're prohibitively expensive. You see them in a lot of rheumatology offices um, that they use them for treating patients. Uh, I actually have a class three laser at my house and I've noticed benefits for, uh, wound healing speed and like using it on certain trigger points and joints. And I use it on my dog, um, <laughs> in dogs don't have a placebo effect. It's like, yeah, he's moving around better. Um, and I do notice that like, uh, abrasions, lacerations, uh, that kind of thing will heal up faster using that 830 nanometer class three laser. But if you're able to find a laser on Amazon for 150 bucks, it's like save your money. Cause it's probably just no more than a laser pointer or a flashlight that'll burn mm -hmm. your eyeballs. Uh, but it's not going to be a, a depth of penetration or a productive wavelength to affect the cellular metabolic rate and mitochondrial function in the area. Orthotics, Nick, plantar fasciitis, who needs orthotics? Orthotics are a temporary intervention for most people if they don't have a genetic, uh, like a super weird shaped foot or a club foot, or uh, they can be helpful for heel pain in adolescence using like the gel heel cups. Uh, they can be helpful for people with the uh, fat pad atrophy long-term, or you get patients that they're 90 years old. You're probably not going to change. You're not going to teach them too many new tricks. So it's like, all right, I could take a bunch of this 90 year old lady's money and not really change that her knees bang together when she stands up. Um, I can just send her to the running store and get a rigid orthotic and it, will help out. But for most people in the average demographic that we see heel pain, um, I tell people this is a temporary intervention, almost in the same vein as like a night splint um, to where it's like, we want to wear these to keep from picking the scab as much until we get the requisite problem fixed that created the issue. Yeah, 100% on board. Orthotic, they're missing the second word. It's called orthotic therapy. Uh, and most people like eyeglasses, you know, your prescription changes. The goal of the orthotic is to get you out of the orthotic. It's progressively to use less and less and less invasive orthotic to get you out of it. Unless you have a true relevant keyword uh, structural deformity that you cannot adapt around, uh, get you in an orthotic progressively teach your body with exercise how to manage, how to perform the habit that we want, phase you out of it. Unless you have a true relevant structural deformity, you can't compensate around. Hey, Nick, uh, the injectables, cortisone, any role for that in plantar fasciitis or plantar fasciopathy? If you want to do the surgery for yourself and rupture it, then yes. <laughs> or if we have those timeline things of like, all right, I dropped 20K on this trip to Machu Picchu 
in like, I don't care what the long-term side effects are. I just want to enjoy my trip. I'm like, yeah, go get a shot, but don't expect that that shot's going to fix you. Cause that's like the star in Mario brothers. Like if you aren't doing anything productive during that uh, period, it's like unplugging the controller when you have the invincibility star in Mario brothers, like we want to run our ass to the end of the level and climb the flagpole before that thing wears off. Yeah, hundred percent. I agree. Short term, I've had people like I'm, like you said, I'm going to walk uh, the Camino Real in in Spain, and it's like four days away. And I was like, find the ortho or the podiatrist because miracles only happen, uh, you know, at, at church on Sundays, right? So, yeah. And uh, I once had a podiatrist tell me, like, you know, if you can't get this plantar fascia under control, I'm just going to keep injecting it. And I was like, for what purpose? And they're just like, well, it'll feel better. And then it'll rupture. And I'm like, and then you're going to do what when it ruptures? Well, I'm going to recommend an orthotic. Seems like a backwards way to prescribe an orthotic in the first place, mm-hmm. right? Like yeah. we're going to destroy the plantar fascia, then to prescribe an orthotic to help you restore your gait mechanics. And I'm like, that's a backwards way to prescribe an orthotic. So yeah. orthobiologics, hot topic these days in, uh, in uh, you know physical medicine. Who's an orthobiologic candidate for plantar fasciitis? Are you lumping in PRP with that or just the... Yeah, stem cell and PRP. So PRP, I've seen some benefit, but that's kind of muddied by, did the patient get better uh, from six weeks being in a boot? Or did they get better from the combination of being booted and injected with PRP? Because you'll see that the the plantar fascia, when they measure the thickness, it will go down on follow-up exams. So it's not just a placebo effect because it is actually changing the kind of that chronic thickening of the insertion of the plantar fascia. Um, in general, like orthobiologics, like the stem cell stuff, uh, unless you're flying to Panama to get it done, you might as well just inject dead toenails into somebody because it's about as effective as that. Uh, you don't have spots in the U.S. outside of three research sites where they're doing like legit pluripotent uh, stem cell injections um, for um, like they're testing it for hip and knee arthritis um, and they're getting great results. But like guys that want to get like legit pluripotent stem cell injections, they're flying to Panama to get it done. Um, yeah. And the- in the United but, States, we uh, we can only harvest stem cells um, from the, the patient's own body, and they can't magnify the effect. So they can't try to, to tinker with it to increase the number and the viability of stem cells. I think that's what Nick is referring to. Um, outside of a research, uh, specific approved research clinical trial, which creates a quandary because if you're going to go big, it's go big or go home. And that, that's what Nick is referring to is out of the country. They don't have the restrictions. And we're seeing data from foreign countries that can tinker with that for sets, a dosage, viability. I think that's what you're referring to. Yes. And um, the, the director of those research studies is actually from San Antonio, Jaime Garza. He's doing it through um, his clinic here in town, through Tulane. And then there's a site out in Pennsylvania that they're doing studies with the, the NFL Hall of Fame because he played for the Saints. Hmm. Um, Nick, last thing: Is there a role for surgery in the plantar fascia? You know, where they snip the uh, one of the bands or multiple bands of the plantar fascia? Um, I don't see the value in it. I haven't had someone come in bragging about on uh, how good they feel if if they do get surgical intervention. The only people I've seen that have had positive surgical interventions for plantar fasciitis or plantar fasciopathy uh, is with like a 10 X type procedure, which is more of like, all right, we're just going to cut you open to do some, some other form of, uh, pulse wave therapy that targets the collagen type that is, uh, not necessarily consistent with good, healthy tissue. Uh, let's pivot here real quick. Uh, another topic that drives our ACPs nuts, degenerative spine conditions, namely lumbar spondylosis, cervical spondylosis. What is this condition? What is spondylosis? It is natural aging of the spine if it's considered what we would say age appropriate. Um, in It is basically just gray hair of the spine. Um, after age 35, you can have an old worn out weak spine or an old worn out strong spine. 
So I tend to reduce the threat that patients perceive of them being damaged goods by saying, would you go up to your grandma and say you have degenerative face disease because you have wrinkles? <laughs> uh, if the answer is no, that's essentially what like you're thinking about yourself is like, this has been there for a long time. And I tell people like, we're all on a slow march to stenosis and spondylosis. Some just get there faster than others. And some have a little bit more interesting march, but it doesn't necessarily have to be trauma. It's just like, all right, you've danced with gravity for 50 years. Like this stuff's going to wear out. Um, but when you get some wear and tear and thinning of the discs, um, and like facet hypertrophy, as you get some slack in some of those ligaments that surround the disc, you're going to put more of a load on the posterior elements of the spine being the ligamentum flavum, the facets. And then those are going to kind of wear and tear and wear out. Um, so I just tell people it's normal. Like if all of your pain was coming from spondylosis and arthritis, I wouldn't fix any back pain patient over 35 because they all have arthritis. Nick, what role? You mentioned a couple of key structures, the facets. You mentioned the uh, posterior fibers of the disc. You mentioned the annulus, the ligamentum flavum. What role does the end plate itself? I think the end plate's kind of the redheaded stepchild of the movement segment. We didn't know much about it at first, and it, we don't commonly talk about it, at least in my chiropractic co curriculum. And it's been an area I've been reading a lot, a lot on, on modic and end plate changes. What role does the end plate play in spondylosis? You can get some discogenic back pain from certain modic type changes that I have to look up on a chart every time because I'm like, all right, which one of these is something that we need to test their blood for cancer and which one of these is <laughs> kind of an active uh, degenerative process happening? Uh, and then which one of these is just purely benign fatty infiltration, things like that, Schmerl's nodes. Uh, and so I have to look that up every time I do an MRI review with a patient uh, and just because I like there's limited real estate in my brain. And that's something that I'm like, all right, I'm just going to GTS that every time I need to remember it. Um, and f like, but if somebody is having uh, a modic change where they have an active degenerative process happening, um, we we're understanding more about some of these processes in the spine and elsewhere that like we're, we need to give it a little bit more study because osteoarthritis of the knee they're finding is actually uh, more of a active inflammatory process than we thought it was of just like, all right, cartilage is just banging together and it's wearing out, but there is a chemical piece of that process and that can happen in the disc space as well. And I've had some people, I know that happens. Um, even without an image because they'll their back will feel a ton better just if they're on antibiotics for a UTI and they'll biopsy disc material after a miter procedure and they'll have like cultured bacteria in the disc space, which is supposed to be a fairly sterile environment. Um, so I think that uh, the jury's still out on how much we're going to go down that rabbit hole, but it is important to note and read that stuff and not just look at the jelly and the donut as a, just a purely mechanical process. Yeah, there was a landmark study in 2010 to 11, like you, like you referenced, that uh, they gave people that had chronic longstanding degenerative changes a course of antibiotics, and they tracked them, and they gave a placebo, they gave an antibiotic, and you know, I think there was another uh, third third group, and they tracked it over time for symptomatology. And uh, you know, the antibiotic one actually had the greatest benefit as compared to a placebo. And I, I forget what the third group of that study, which is really eye opening, because we we thought about it once as just a purely mechanical phenomenon. Um, so yeah, it'd be interesting to see where that where that uh, research goes. Um, Nick, let's back up here. We we talk about uh, facet and the disc. We're the two big players. What does the end, and, and we just got ahead of ourselves, we talked about modic changes in the end plate. What does the end plate do and what is its relevance to the movement segment? So the end plate kind of gives, um, I view the end plate kind of like um, your, your end plate, if we look at the disc as like a microcosm environment, the end plates are basically your pelvic floor and your diaphragm. It gives something to create pressure. Um, 
And if you have a defect there uh, to where it kind of limits the amount of pressure that the disc can buffer and push against, uh, it's almost like having a hernia. You aren't going to be able to pressurize even if it is a small defect. So you're going to have some um, excess micro, micro movement in that area if you don't have a firm ceiling and floor for that disc to create back pressure on. How do we treat and manage these lumbar and, and cervical spondylosis conditions? What types of treatments and therapies, or how do we know what, what to do in, 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 uh, from our history and our exam? Uh, most of these can be fixed by balancing out the hips and getting rotation in the T-spine. Because if there's things that you're trying to use your back as a hip, it's going to bark. Um, and if you're moving and you're excessively rotating through the lumbar area, which is designed to get about three to five degrees of rotation at a segmental level, um, in where the facet orientation in the T-spine is built for rotation. But if you're a locked up Lego character up there, you're going to rotate through the, your lumbar facets and bad things are going to happen. Um, let me throw a pen here to sh put the light back on. <laughs> um, but overall, um, it's just, all right, we got to get the movement through the right areas. Um, so that we're not aberrantly loading the spine or excessively loading the spine, and then we get good movement. So we get them moving well, then they move often. Mm -hmm. And walking can be a very powerful activity for that in, in absence of uh, like neurogenic claudication from an advanced case um, or someone who has some other comorbidities like or orthopedic issues that they would have an aberrant gait from those. I'm just like, you don't have to do all this crazy stuff. You just need to go walk. Yeah, walking is a known exercise which triggers um, imbibition, if I'm not mistaken, of the disc. And imbibition is pressurization, but more importantly, it's hydration, lubrication, nutrition. And just normal gait patterns, restoring normal gait patterns, the ability to walk and, and put a little force through it can have significantly positive effects. And it's something so easy. We need to walk for general health. But if you combine that general health with spine health and you say, just give me 20 minutes, two to three times a day, and that's your home exercise program, psychologically, they'll feel better, but physically, their back may feel better too. Yeah. Um, let me uh, move on with um, a couple other tidbits uh, here. The last major thing that drives our ACPs nuts, peripheral neuropathy. And I think the biggest thing with peripheral neuropathy, neuropathy is an understanding uh, why and how is a nerve really easy to stir up? How does this happen? Why does it happen? Um, it doesn't, like anyone who's banged their funny bone and had some, a uh, little bit of a transient irritation of their own nerve knows that it doesn't take a large amount of pressure to make a nerve symptomatic. Um, and nerves don't have to be mechanically or traumatically irritated. They can also become more uh, permeable uh, due to chemical irritation. Like if you have like an annular tear in the disc that isn't put in any mechanical compression and they don't have any nerve tension findings, but you can tell that the disc is secreting substance P and making the nerve more hyperpermeable. So there are very touchy structures um, and I don't want people to get the wrong idea on this, but uh, like when patients come in and they have a nerve irritation, whether it's, uh, central spinal peripheral, I tell them like, this nerve is like my wife. It, if it is not happy, nobody involved is going to be happy. <laughs> so when we talk about pushing people through happy pain, wife. yeah, happy life with, with tendons, like you need to push people into a bit of discomfort. But I tell people like, especially if I'm adding a slider glider type of a, a thing, I'm like, all right, this is a very potent exercise, but when added too early in a treatment plan, it can really take us the wrong direction that we don't want to go. So it's like, you're, you're more, uh, you're more educated on the McKenzie protocol of like when you're looking for directional preference or you're mobilizing people, it's like, all right, we, we don't want this to stay elevated after doing an exercise or it's just not the right exercise for you, but we need to get some neurodynamic glide and slide of 
that whole pathway to get this thing calmed down. Yeah, the key thing I I find is not the during, but what you said, the after effect, 20, 30, 40 minutes later, if it stays elevated, pain, loss of function, immobility, disability, wrong choice, right? They get a little bit transient during, monitor it, but if it stays and lingers, no, we got to back off that pretty soon. So what you're saying is that uh, nerves are easy to sensitize, easy to piss off, hard to calm down. And they respond to mechanical stimuli, chemical stimuli, thyroid issues, blood sugar issues, uh, blood pressure issues, and all these things, chemical stimuli and mechanical stimuli. And even bio, bio, the, the psychosocial component can sensitize a nerve. Mm-hmm. Is that kind yeah. of what I'm getting from that? Yeah. How do we settle them down then? Uh, first and foremost, the question in the history is how long has this been – the way it is um because if you have a nerve entrapment that is giving someone either motor weakness or sensory issues or reflex issues that has been constantly there for three years i'm like that plant's dead no amount of water or fertilizer or sunlight is going to bring the dead plant back so why are we going to waste money and resources trying to water the dead plant when we've know it's been dead for three seasons so i just have to give those people the unfortunate news that like not to look for a solution to something that doesn't have a solution like we're just gonna have to plan around it if you've had foot drop for five years i'm not making it go away yeah if it's kind of been touch and go and intermittent and reversible it's like yeah we know that we can get this thing to calm down because if you have windows or positions or times of day where it does get better, then we know it is a changeable phenomenon. But if like I had a guy that evolves two nerve roots out of his neck and looked like he had a stroke in his hand, I'm like, you need to go to Mayo clinic and get a tendon transfer because this is not going to go away because you, you ripped the cord out of your neck. (laughs) Like Mm. you rolled your Jeep over and you ripped two nerve roots in your neck that aren't, no one can reattach that. So it's duration. And then some of these are nightmares. Like you get someone that has like paresthesia and digit four or five in their hand. Um, and it's like, all right, that could be any of the eight ulnar nerve entrapment sites. Um, going from carpal tunnel, Guion, cubital tunnel, um, all the way up, it could be because TOS manifests on the ulnar side usually first. Could be an entrapment there. Could be a C8 radic. Could be something all the way up in the like the descending tracks of the spinal cord. So it can become a diagnostic nightmare to where sometimes you just have to start somewhere and then kind of gauge the response. If if the patient doesn't have the resources or doesn't elect to do like a, an EMG procedure, like you're not going to do that day one until you at least try. So they can be a bit tricky, but a lot of them it's like, all right, if you use the tools that you learn, um, a lot of times you can kind of tease out like, okay, is this just sensory? Is this just motor? Um, are we getting atrophy? Uh, you can kind of tease out, like at least a ballpark of where to point the crosshairs for your intervention. Now, assuming you have a patient in the office, they have intermittent, let's focus on the, the, you know, you kind of, you kind of went the route of like a constant numbness, tingling, burning, you got sensory and motor deficits and it's longstanding. And we need our colleagues our neurosurgical colleagues, our physical medicine and rehab, maybe for the EMGs, NCVs and neurologists uh, of the world. Assuming you have something that's intermittent comes and goes um, and, and, and it's low level, not so much strength changes, maybe some sensory changes, no reflex changes. And you have a peripheral neuropathy nerves heal. What is the time frame for which a nerve can potentially regenerate, heal, or we can start seeing significant traction towards improvement. And this is about setting expectations. Like our tendinopathy discussion is they usually heal about a millimeter a day. Okay. And I'll explain some of these neuropathy that I know we're going to get a reversal, but I call it a nerve bruise. It's like bruises heal, but they don't, there's nothing you can do to make them heal faster. 
just a, a waiting game. But if you keep on punching the bruise, it's going to lengthen your recovery time. So we just need to stop punching the bruise. Let's transition here real quick to some simple management advice. So those are the top five conditions, and they were plantar fasciopathy, tendinopathies, frozen shoulder, peripheral neuropathies, and uh, lumbar spondylosis, and a partridge in a pair. We had some questions from our ACPs on management advice. So give me one, one or two quick little blurbs on the following topic, overtraining syndrome. And the two things that we had on this were how do we identify it and how do we tell a patient you need to stop activity, right? Because we're in the mindset of we, and part of the reason why people come to us is because they want to continue to do the activities they want to do. They want to come utilize us, continue to do their things. But there is a time and a place, I'd argue, for what, you need to slow your roll, you need to slow down, you need to unload this for a period of time. So how do we identify overtraining syndrome? And how, when do we recommend, hey, stay away, stop the stop recommendation? So the first early hallmark sign of overtraining is interrupted sleep because um, you're going to get blood sugar fluctuations due to the elevated cortisol levels in a patient that is overtraining. Um, and I have a lot of patients that are overtraining. Um, it's a difficult conversation to have because what will happen is someone will overtrain and then their cortisol levels cause them to like the body's not going to like burn body fat for fuel. So these people gain weight rather than losing weight with excessive training. And you just need to tell them like, all right, why are we doing this? Kind of try and get in their head on why. And then you can kind of like set a compromise. Like a lot of these people aren't going to go from, cranked up to 11 down to zero, but you at least need to meet them in the middle somewhere and come to a, a, a compromise of how much is too much. And these are the boundaries and the guidelines. Otherwise, I'm not going to continue to treat you if you're self-destructing and not following my advice. Uh, yeah, I, I, I like that. We can use the, uh, the watches, the monitors, the tracking apps on the phone, all of it now to kind of look for interruption in sleep patterns and abnormal heart rate variability, which is a really key indicator for us. And to the point, uh, I like what you said. I have had patients over the years that have been marathoners and have told me I'm gaining weight despite the high volume of activity. And I, act, and I asked them, are you participating in a majority of your training runs as scheduled 80, 90%? Yes. And you're still gaining weight? Yeah. And I use the criteria imminent harm. Uh, if you're in imminent harm of uh, something that is a negative long-term health consequence, a stress fracture that turns into a fracture, uh, you, you increase a metabol metabolic cascade of blood sugar, blood, blood pressure dysregulation that can lead to long-standing problems, I need to tell you to stop. Everything else I'm comfortable with modifying the activity, but if you're in imminent harm, uh, it's, it's a no-go. Mm -hmm. um, cool. Pain psychologist, one of our ACPs had a question, management piece. When do we need to bring in a pain psychologist in a discussion and conversation? Uh, if you can kind of tease out some stuff in the history that the patient is going through, either a fear avoidance situation with their sport or activity, or you can tell that things are not great at home due to a relationship issue or death in the family or things like that. And then you you can kind of like, I just kind of tell people like, all right, pain, there is a mental piece uh, and not everyone with depression is depressed because they hurt. Some people hurt because they're depressed. Uh, and so these things are really interrelated. And a lot of times you just have to tell the patient that that is available to them and just leave it at that because it can be a touchy situation because uh, no one wants to be told that they're their pain is all in their head and they're crazy. But the patient will usually tell you when they need that intervention. But if they don't know it's available, they're not going to mention it because they don't know it's an option. Next, next major question from our uh, Rasti colleagues. Um, stopping a trial of care. Uh, there, uh, one of the, the things that I struggled with initially at my time at Rasti, and sometimes I struggle with a bit now to be, to be quite, quite honest and quite frank and throw myself under the bus on this one is you can't fully fix a patient. Uh, they get better, but they won't resolve. They're not quite surgical. They're in this kind of weird loop. 
of what to do, how to, how to do it. And obviously there's a lot of fear, worry, and concern on the patient's aspect. So how do we treat and manage these cases that we may not resolve? Uh, is it changing the definition, changing the mindset? These weird, this weird loop, they won't fully get better, but they'll get a little bit better, but we haven't made expectations. How do we manage those cases? I go back to the patient's goals that they set on visit one. And a lot of times we can lose perspective on what the patient's actually there for because we set loftier goals for the patient than they actually have for themselves. So it's like, if you go back to the, their goals that you set for short and long term, and the patient isn't perfect, but you've achieved the goals for like three visits now, it's like, it's time to just have that discussion with the patient of, all right, we've achieved our short and long-term goals. This is not affecting your ADLs. You're sleeping where you weren't before going through the, the progress and tell them like, all right, this is how much short we are of what your view of a hundred percent is, but this is what I think it would take for you to get to a hundred percent. And is the juice worth the squeeze? Or are you just okay with playing the slow game of, yeah, this may kind of just maybe tincture a time and continuing to load or do the, the rehab at home, but it's not going to require any more medical interventions because the medical interventions that would be needed to get to get to their perception of 100% are either cost prohibitive, dangerous, or have a higher likelihood of making them feel worse than they do right now. Yeah, I like that. I like that. And the, the thing that you mentioned, bringing it back to the patient, right? That's why they're here. And if we're at or near or, or, or getting close to meeting their expectations and we can't fully in our mind resolve it, it's not about us. It's about about them. So I like that. Bringing it back to the patient. Yeah, that, that's a good one. Pelvic floor. Uh, I got a question from an Arasti, uh, one of our Arasti colleagues about how do we parse out in the history and exam that low back or in hip or uh, something like that, hip pain or low back pain or sacroiliac pain is pelvic floor other than the musculoskeletal stuff, low back, hip, or acid joint? Um, I've sent one male patient to pelvic floor therapy. So female gender is a big one. Um, females that have had multiple children, the, if their symptoms are onset in a postpartum or after a difficult natural birth, uh, if they have painful intercourse, uh, urinary incontinence, um, they, they like pee themselves every time they cough or sneeze. Uh, and they just have this like waxing and waning, like without an appropriate trigger of what I call cousin Eddie back pain to where it just kind of pops up and it's, um, it's a, it's a problem that always shows that's an up. Appropriate, at the... That's an appropriate reference. It's, it's yeah. the 16th of December and cousin Eddie's coming to somebody's house here pretty soon. <laughs> Shitter's full, but those are Such the main things movie, I man. look for in like most of the ones I've sent for pelvic floor therapy to a specialist who does it, um, they get great results. Um, but you, another one of those things is like the mental health professional. You just have to let them know like, Hey, this could be a diagnosis of exclusion. If we can get you there to where you feel good, we won't have to pull that trigger. But a lot of pelvic floor PT is cash based. And it's not always a viable option for someone who is on a very fixed income or they're, they're doing a lot with a little bit of money. Yeah. They're trying to make things stretch. Uh, and, yeah. uh, some, some's got to go. Um, and the other thing I think when you prep somebody from a pelvic floor PT referral, that's important is, Oh, by the way, it's going to be uncomfortable because they may do some internal things that I am not legally allowed to perform but it is a standard part of pelvic floor PT practice that they would do these things. Uh, and you have to be prepared for somebody to perform these things. And if you're even uncomfortable with the idea, then this won't work. Yeah. And then you, you kind of like leave them with that, let them stew over it. And if they accept the referral, great. And if they don't, you made them aware because if they walk in and they feel like they're violated and don't know it, it's a bigger problem. Yeah. And I tell people that in bundled up in the conversation of why I'm not going to do that. It's like, yeah, that's not legal for me to do. And this is 
what they're most likely going to do. And neither of us want me to do that to you or show you how to do it to yourself. Uh, Cause this is, this is a close on relationship. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> I remind me sometime we get together for, for coffee or dinner or beer or something to tell you about the nice couple that were uh, French that came to the office sometime. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's a funny story. Um, last thing, uh, we got an excellent question. Uh, I believe it's Dr. David Smith. I think he's up in Dallas, Fort Worth. Uh, if memory serves me correct, career longevity for ACPs, mental health, physical health, emotional health. Uh, what's the best two or three management management pieces that you can give to our ACPs for career longevity? Um, I've tried to train my patients to not really lean on me for administrative stuff that could be handled through an online portal, an app. Like even if I have my computer in front of me to schedule somebody, I make them do it through the app because I don't have time to schedule or reschedule a bunch of people. I try and create a low maintenance patient base uh, to where they don't think I'm just bored sitting around waiting for them to send me an email or make me fill something out for their work. Uh, I'm still going to go through the extra mile and do things for people, but if I can cut down on the things that I don't have to do uh, when we have a channel for the patient to do that themselves or talk to one of our, our coworkers or team members that that's their job, um, I'm not going to do that because it's a death by thousand cuts thing with burnout. You don't want to do things that you don't have to do if there's already an established system and process for that. Um, one other thing is like, if I can push an arbitrary amount and fix the person, I push just that hard. Like I'm not going to over pressure a patient or put more pressure on them. Uh, than I need to, to get it to respond on um, when, like, I got to do this for a long time. And I have been doing it for a long time because that's my strategy is I don't just like beat the heck out of people. I don't push as hard as I did when I first started because I can feel things release and respond. And I do spend a little bit more time on uh, examining so I don't have to just take an oozy approach of what to treat. I may treat a more finite area because my exam uh, sent me down that path so I don't have to like scorched earth the whole quarter of this person's body because I had a a poor exam and I'm just throwing crap at the wall. Yeah, I agree. Think five minutes to treat two. Like mm -hmm. spend more time in assessment and understanding the relevance of different things to, to treat too. And then moder I agree, 100% moderating your pressure because I'm the same way seven years in. I use less now than I did before because I got to sustain my body over time. And then the other thing too is you can explain to a patient about bruising and some people wear it like a badge of honor. They walked out of a rosti and get bruised. But if they walk out of a rosti, didn't get bruised and got the same result, everybody wins. Uh, yeah. So yeah, 100%. Nick, hey, thank you for your time. We've been on quite a bit of time. Can we sum this up and, and can you give us your closing thoughts, what you'd like to convey to the masses and then where and how can people find you? Well, I appreciate you having me on. Uh, as far as where you can find me, um, I'm on Instagram at, at kickaski. Um, you can reach out to me through there. Uh, you can email me. Um, but email, like sometimes it falls through the cracks, uh, cause I get so many emails, but overall, like, I think that if you let me like assault your ear for an hour and a half, um, uh, and you made it this far, uh, you're, you're probably in a pretty good spot cause you're curious, you're learning, you're growing, um, in just as you get more experience as a doc, you just want to have the discipline to just continue to learn and grow. And uh, early on, I think when you're you're reading and, and digging into material when you're new, 80% of that should be in your field of subject of like, all right, musculoskeletal medicine. Uh, but as you get more seasoned and you've been in the field longer, that should switch to where 20% of the stuff you read should be in your field. And then 80% of your reading or research should be 
uh, in fields that maybe aren't yours to inspire some creativity and avoid the burnout and the monotony of just learning about the same things over and over and over again. And you may get a little bit of creative inspiration that takes you down a rabbit hole that was blocked before by reading um, philosophy or a different branch of medicine or reading um, about these things that, aren't, that don't necessarily have a lot to do with what you do for a living. Yeah, I, I like that. And uh, I listened to a podcast yesterday about uh, burnout, finding purpose in your 40s. And I'm in my 40s now. And uh, what they said was try to get out of your discipline and area of expertise and practice. And what you may find is some lessons that you can apply to what you do. But at the very least, that keeps the mind fresh, right? Mm -hmm. uh, mind's a very powerful tool. It propels you to 100 miles. It propels all of us to do the things that we do at a very high level. Doc, thank you so much for your time and generosity in answering all, all of our questions. This is the We Fix Pain podcast number 20 with Dr. Nick Askey. Ask it. And we are signing off. Thanks, Doc. Thank you.